In this video I'm going to talk about writing for the web and specifically what I call the basic principles of writing for the web. That's brevity, adaptability, scannability, interactivity and community or conversation. The first principle, brevity, is perhaps one of the uh, most basic journalistic principles, the idea of keeping sentences short, using simple words rather than complex ones, and always trying to boil your language down to language that's clear, that makes sense to your audience. With the web in particular, you want to make sure that the paragraphs in your writing are ultra short. This example from the BBC, for example, is a, a really good example of, of brief writing, keeping it short. As soon as you've made a point in your sentence, full stop, and start a new paragraph. It's very pared back. And if you want an example of web writing, the BBC is, is one of the best you can find. Equally, when you look at your own writing, it's worth splitting your paragraphs by looking um, as soon as you've finished one sentence, or even when you've finished one point, can you split up that paragraph on that point? And this is a, a good practice to get into when editing your web for the web. What's worth remembering about the web is that there's a lot of research that suggests people um, read more slowly on the web and take in less information. What's also particularly interesting is that they actually spend more time reading shorter paragraphs. So the fewer words you have in a paragraph, actually the more time they're likely to spend on it. And brevity applies to the length of your content overall as well. Um, there's no need to write 800 words on a subject because you're not filling a particular space in a newspaper or magazine. So really think carefully about whether your content justifies the length that it's being given. Moving on to scannability. Um, scannability is about the idea that when you write for the web, you should make it easy for people to find different points in your article and different ways into that. The Daily Mail, for example, use images really effectively as catch points in an article. More traditionally, you would certainly look to use subheadings in your writing to break up an article. So I would recommend every few paragraphs in an article consider inserting a new subheading to introduce that new part of that story. And a good tip with the subheadings is to write them in the same way as you do headlines, think about the content that follows, and look for key phrases that might make a good subheading. Other elements of subheadings include, uh, other elements of scannability, sorry, include links, block quotes, and um, uh, bullet points. Anything that really breaks up the text, bold text, for example, you can take when a first name is mentioned or when an, a place is first mentioned, make it bold and that will make it easier for people to notice that a new actor has entered the story. With a number of publications, they will actively break up the text by inserting links to related stories. So it doesn't have to necessarily be um, a part of the article itself for you to introduce scannability. This is closer, for example, linking to a related debate. When you're linking in um, online writing, make sure that you are linking the verb. So if you're linking to some sort of article where someone has said something, you want to link the word she said or she told the New York Times. If you're linking to an actual report, then you can link the object. So in other words, the reference to that object. But most of the time, try to link on a verb. And linking is not only a property of scannability, it makes it easier for people to scan articles, but it also is absolutely fundamental to interactivity. And interactivity is probably as crucial to writing for the web as sounds are for the radio or images are for TV. If you're not linking in your online writing, then you're really probably not writing for the web. You're just writing a print article that happens to have been put online. So always look for opportunities to link. A new way of linking is embedding. So increasingly, um, you might not need to actually link to content, but instead can embed it directly into the article. 
That might be a video, for example. So instead of mentioning a YouTube video and linking to it, you can embed it directly in there. Or it might be a social media update. You might be reporting about something that someone has said on social media. Well, you can embed that directly into the article. In most platforms, including Medium and WordPress, you can create an embedded video or social media update by pasting the URL of that content on its own line and pressing enter. And the content management system, Medium or WordPress will detect that that's a video or a social media update and will turn it into an embed. One of the great advantages of doing this is that people can interact with the content directly within the story. So for example, with a video, obviously they can play the video right there and then. They can also pause it, comment on it and do other things. With social media, it goes further. People can obviously read the content. They can watch uh, videos and look at images in the tweet or the Facebook update or the Instagram update. But they can also follow those people, retweet and so on. Now the disadvantage is that if this content disappears, then the embed stops working as well. With videos, there's clearly not a lot you can do with that. And you might have noticed uh, articles yourself where a dead video has been embedded. With social media, however, um, it, sometimes you might decide to take a screenshot instead of embedding, particularly if you think that the update might disappear or be removed later on. If you want to see examples of good web writing, different publications have different strengths and weaknesses. I've mentioned already the BBC's strength with um, brevity. Uh, it also links relatively well, and BuzzFeed also links very well. The Daily Mail uses images particularly well, as I've already mentioned, and actually bullet lists as another form of scannability. The Guardian is very good at thinking about adaptability, a principle that we've not really touched on much, but it's the idea that you as a journalist should be adaptable in the platform that you use to tell your story, and also the idea that your content should be adaptable or you should consider it. And by that I mean that um, are you making it possible for other people to do things with your reporting? That might be things like sharing the data behind it or um, publishing your video under a Creative Commons license. These are both examples of making your content adaptable. And HuffPost, uh, the actual brand HuffPost, was built on the idea of a community of bloggers and celebrity bloggers. And it, it's rooted in that idea of community contribution. Equally, BuzzFeed's community section also is a very healthy example of the use of community in online journalism. So those are just some of the, what I call the basic principles of web writing. The key points to remember here are, first of all, the idea of keeping things short, splitting up paragraphs so that you're not going on for too long. Secondly, making your content scannable. So look to add subheadings, look to insert links into your content. Use images to break up stories as well. And block quotes are a great way to indicate to the reader that you have a quote, you've got some original reporting in your story. A block quote is where you select a quote in a story and format it to be indented and, and italic. Again, in content management systems like Medium and WordPress, to do this, you simply select the text. On Medium, a menu will appear where you can click a quotation button to make it a block quote. And on WordPress, there will be a button in the menu above where you can make it a block quote in a similar way. Also make your content interactive. Always look to link to the background, uh, the, the sources that you've used to create the article, the, the sources of quotes or reports or anything like that. And also think about embedding social media elements and video and other multimedia. And then finally the C of BASIC is the idea of conversation and communication. In other words, your content online is part of a wider conversation, so don't see it as the start and end of a journey. Think about what the user might want to do next. Consider what are called CTAs, or calls to action. A call to action might be something like, comment below, or have you seen something, let us know. 
Another way that you can use calls to action are in headlines and titles and social media updates as well. So for example, instead of writing that you've done an interview with uh, you know, the man who invented um, the Mars bar, your call to action version of that headline might be something like meet the man who invented the Mars bar. So you're calling the reader to meet the man. Likewise, if you've created an interactive map in a story, your call to action might be explore our interactive map of food hygiene inspections. Other calls to action can be watch this video or listen to this audio and so on. Think about how you can bring the reader in by addressing them directly. And more broadly, think about whenever you're editing your stories for the web, think about brevity, adaptability, scannability, interactivity, and conversation and community, that, that basic series of considerations. You can uh, read more on some of these techniques in chapter five of the online journalism handbook, and that's what you should be doing next. Reference it as well, refer to it in your evaluation, in your critical reflection on your work. Use it to inform what you do, and then talk about that and make sure you refer to the reading that influenced it.